speaking for himself following last week's general election. President Yoon Song yeol says he will carefully listen to the people, with his message directed towards people's livelihoods. The president also says that he's sorry for failing to reflect upon public opinion, according to his senior aide. Japan renews its false territorial claims to Korea's Tokyo Island in its diplomatic paper, sparking a strong backlash from Seoul. Also, Tokyo yet again refuses to accept a South Korean court ruling over compensation of Korean victims of Japan's wartime forced labor. Marking 10 years somber anniversary of the Seoul Ferry disaster that took the lives of hundreds of young people, we take a closer look tonight at how the victims are remembered. It's April 16, 2024. This is News Center. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yoon Jung Min. President Yoon Song Yeol today delivered a speech on the outcome of the April 10th election, saying that he will carefully listen to the people as he expressed his regret. The South Korean leader elaborated on how his administration would proceed over the next three years on its key policies. Our correspondent Oh Soo-young starts us off. President Yoon suk yeol has apologized for his failure to communicate and reflect the needs of Korean citizens, humbly accepting their choice to vote in an opposition majority into parliament. This came at Tuesday's cabinet meeting, where the South Korean leader conveyed his position on the outcome of last week's general election, which saw a crushing defeat for Yoon's ruling People Power Party, casting a shadow over the next three years of his presidency. Yoon said he had focused on making systematic improvements to the Korean economy, but in the grand scheme of things, the administration had failed to deliver tangible improvements to people's livelihoods. To this end, Yoon plans to continue a series of policy forums around the nation, which invite local citizens to discuss issues affecting their livelihoods. Yoon also vowed to move ahead with his three major reforms for education, labor and pensions to overcome fundamental barriers to future economic growth, as well as push for medical reform. More crucially, the president pledged to become more humble and flexible in his communication and listen carefully to the voices of the people in recognition of their diverse needs. A senior aide to Yun added that the president in his closing remarks said he was sorry for failing to reflect upon public opinion and that he had been the first to fail to communicate. Yun's office has been seen as lacking in public engagement and uncompromising in pushing through policies without sufficient discourse. Also leading up to the election, the controversy surrounding Yoon's Secretary for Social Affairs and his ambassador to Australia had further dampened public opinion. With Yoon having promised a reform of how his administration runs state affairs, the president is expected to replace his most senior officials, including his chief of staff and the prime minister, who offered to resign last Thursday. Yoon Zay told reporters that given the enormity of these positions, the new appointments will take time, indicating this week may be too soon. A structural reform of his office is also expected in order to become more communicative and reflective of public opinion and work with the opposition in parliament. Regarding the possibility of the president meeting opposition leader Lee Jae-myung, the official indicated that all possibilities are open for communication with the opposition. However, as the ruling party's leadership has not been consolidated, the meeting would take at least the minimum amount of time for both sides to make it happen. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News. Japan has renewed its false territorial claims to Korea's easternmost Tokdo Island in its diplomatic paper, sparking a strong backlash from Seoul. The report also reiterated that it would not accept South Korea's ruling, ordering Japanese firms to compensate Korean victims of Japan's wartime forced labor. Choi min Jung reports. Japan has yet again made territorial claims over Tokdo Island in its annual foreign policy report. 
In its 2024 diplomatic blue book released on Tuesday, Tokyo renewed its false claim that Tokto is Japanese territory and stated that Seoul continued its illegal occupation of Tokto. It's a claim that has been repeatedly made in Japan's diplomatic blue book since 2018. South Korea responded with a strong protest against what it called Japan's repeated unfair territorial claims. The foreign ministry called for an immediate withdrawal of the claim. There is no territorial dispute over Dokto as it is clearly our territory historically, geographically, and under international law. Our government exercises firm territorial sovereignty over Dokto, and we will respond firmly and strictly to any unjust claims regarding Dokto. The ministry also summoned the deputy chief of mission at the Japanese embassy in Seoul. The Blue Book also disputed a South Korean Supreme Court ruling which ordered Japanese firms to compensate South Korean victims of wartime forced labor during Japan's colonial rule. Despite repeated requests over the years, Japan has refused to make reparations to individuals, insisting all matters were settled under the 1965 treaty that normalized bilateral ties. In an attempt to mend relations with Japan, Seoul last year implemented plans to settle the issue of compensation through funds procured through a third party. We hope Japan will continue to make efforts to develop a future-oriented bilateral relationship while inheriting the historical awareness of Japan's past cabinets. Our government will continue to make efforts to help victims recover through the compensation plan. Meanwhile, the Blue Book describes South Korea as an important neighboring country that Japan should cooperate with as a partner. This reflects a significant improvement in bilateral ties since President Yoon suk yeol took office in 2022, as Tokyo last called Seoul a partner 14 years ago. Choi min Dong, Arirang News. It's been 10 years since the tragic sinking of the Sewol ferry that took the lives of so many young people in the country. We take a closer look at how the victims are remembered on this day. Our Choi soo tells the story. April 16, 2014. In the west coastal waters of Jindo, Jeollanam-do province in South Korea, the Sewol ferry accident took 304 people's lives. For the past 10 years, the families left behind have remained in deep sorrow, but they have been supporting each other to help overcome their pain. In 2021, the families created the Tanwan High School 4.16 memory classroom to preserve the records and mementos of the dead students. In this empty classroom, the dreams and futures of the 254 Tanwan High School students who made up most of the victims have been frozen for a decade. The government also acknowledged the national responsibility for the Sewol tragedy and recognized the value of the records in this space. The Korean Ministry of Interior and Safety has added the Tanon High School 4.16 Memorial Classroom to the National Archives of Korea in 2021, preserving it as a place of public memory. As the mother of Kim Do-hun, a second-year Class 3 student, one of the victims and the curator of the memory classroom said there are memoirs that should not be forgotten. The people of South Korea and everyone around the world vividly witnessed the Sewol tragedy happen on that day. This space is not just for memories of the disaster and the wounds it caused, but also a place for the future where we overcome pain and create hope. The day remains a deep wound in Koreans' hearts as well. Although I don't remember it well, I have visited here ever since the Sewol incident happened. I thought that such a thing should never happen again. The memorial ceremony was held in Ansan, Gyeonggi-do province on Tuesday, home to the Tanwon High School, which most of the victims attended, marking the 10th anniversary. Over 3,000 people attended the ceremony. The names of the 304 victims were called out one by one, including the five whose remains have yet to be recovered. At 4.16 p.m., a siren sounded to honor the victims and to remind people to be aware of potential disasters painful but continuing to replay memories, this is how they heal their wounds and mourn their lost children. Che Su Hyung, Arirang News, Ansan.
In Washington earlier on Monday, officials from South Korea and their U.S. counterparts addressed the status of North Korea's human rights situation. According to Seoul's Foreign Ministry on this Tuesday, its official Chun Yong-hee sat down with Julie Turner, U.S. Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights Issues. The ministry added that Pyongyang's, quote, obsession with nuclear and missile capabilities is violating the basic rights of people in North Korea. The two officials, for their part, have reportedly agreed to advance efforts to raise greater awareness of the regime's appalling actions. The top U.S. envoy to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, visited the DMZ today. There, the U.S. ambassador said just miles to the south, there is democracy and prosperity, and just miles to the north, repression and isolation. She said this is due to North Korea's, quote, escalatory rhetoric, misguided decision-making, and destabilizing actions that endanger the peace and security of the region. She added the U.S. remains open to dialogue without preconditions and urged the North to show up to the table in good faith. The top U.S. envoy to the U.N. has been visiting South Korea from Sunday till Wednesday. Moving on to the international front, Israel is reportedly considering, quote, painful retaliation that would avoid escalating into a full-scale war in response to Iran's air raid this past weekend. The U.S. claims it took place without warning from Tehran. Shin Ha-young has more. Israel's war cabinet met on Monday to discuss how to respond to a direct attack from Iran against a country overnight on Saturday. According to Israeli media outlet Channel 12, Israel is weighing up retaliation options that are intended to be painful to Iran, but without causing an all-out war in a way that coordinates with allies, including the U.S. Following the attack at the weekend, U.S. President Joe Biden warned that Washington would not participate in any counteroffensives launched against Iran and would only continue to assist in defending Israel after it helped to shoot down most of the missiles launched on Saturday alongside other allies. During the meeting, the Israeli cabinet reportedly agreed on a strong response to make it clear that Israel does not tolerate Iran's recent attacks. We are considering our next steps and this launch of so many missiles, cruise missiles and drones into Israeli territory will be met with a response. Meanwhile, Iran said it gave notice to neighboring countries and the U.S. days before it attacked Israel, but the U.S. denied the claim. But there was never any message to us or to anyone else on the time frame, the targets or the type of response. White House National Security Council spokesman John Carby said that Washington is working with G7 countries on new multilateral sanctions to target Iran's missile programs. He added that G7 countries that had yet to designate the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization are now considering doing so. Pentagon Press Secretary Patrick Ryder on Monday reiterated remarks made earlier by U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, emphasizing a desire to avoid escalation in tensions while affirming the commitment to protect its forces in the region and defend Israel. According to a report by CNN, Israel was set to launch a ground offensive in Gaza's southern city of Rafah, but the plans were paused after Iran's weekend attack. Shin Ayong, Arirang News. In New York, the jury selection process began Monday local time for former U.S. President Donald Trump's trial involving his alleged role in a hush money scheme before the 2016 U.S. presidential election. However, the court adjourned without picking any jurors due to concerns over impartiality. Or Ishi, who brings us up to speed on the case. On Monday, Donald Trump became the first former U.S. president to face a criminal trial as jury selection began in New York involving his alleged role in a hush money payment scheme during the waning days of the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Trump is facing charges of falsifying business records to cover up a $130,000 U.S. dollars payment made to adult film star Stormy Daniels to buy her silence about a 2006 sexual encounter Daniels said they had. The former president is pleading not guilty to all the charges and denying any such relationship with Daniels. This is blowing up as he strives for another shot at the White House as the presumptive Republican nominee for the presidential election in the fall. 
But on the first day of the historic trial, the court adjourned without selecting any jurors after the judge dismissed more than half of the 96 prospective candidates brought in because they said they did not think they could be fair and impartial. Justice Juan Merchant told them that they must set aside any biases or personal attitudes about the defendant or the case, including political orientation. The trial is scheduled to resume on Tuesday morning local time. Meanwhile, Trump railed against the judge before he entered the courtroom, calling the trial a scam. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. There's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. It should Outside the courthouse, Trump supporters and anti-Trump protesters fill the streets. And this is, this is not the America I grew up in. It's frightening and it's horrible and people are not speaking out. We individually and collectively are glad to see that Trump is finally being brought in front of a judge in a criminal case. Falsifying business records in New York is a felony punishable by up to four years in prison, although many found guilty previously have been sentenced to fines or probation. This is one of four criminal prosecutions Trump faces and the only one guaranteed to go to trial before the November 5th election. Lee Si-ho, Arirang News. Korea's import price index gained 0.4 percent on month in March, and pundits believe the upward trend may persist this month. Our economics correspondent Moon Hyeon has more. High international oil prices and domestic fruit prices drove up South Korea's imports in March. Preliminary data released by the Bank of Korea on Tuesday show that the country's import price index rose 0.4 percent compared to the month before. It's the third month in a row that an on-month increase has been recorded. By category, raw materials, including mining products, saw the biggest hike, with oil import prices jumping by 4 percent from February. Crude oil prices have surged due to heightened tensions in the Middle East, rising to nearly 85 U.S. dollars a barrel in March and surpassing 90 dollars earlier this month. A spokesperson from the central bank added that in light of the upward trend in oil prices, the import index for April could also see a rise. Recent data from the Korea Customs Service also show that fruit imports saw a large jump last month, with the total import value of pineapples and mangoes being the highest ever on record. Pineapple imports came to nearly 8.7 million US dollars, while mango imports came to just over 24.7 million dollars. Orange and banana imports too saw a significant rise, with the total value of inbound shipments for each reaching the highest level in nearly five years and three years respectively. This comes as unfavorable weather conditions led to a surge in domestic fruit prices over the past few months, prompting the government to pledge reduced import tariffs on a record number of different types of fruit. Meanwhile, the country's exports saw an on-month climb of 0.4 percent in March, which is the third straight month that the country's export price index has risen. Chemical goods as well as computing and electronic goods drove up exports, with higher prices for memory chips contributing greatly to this upward tick. The BOK explained that semiconductor prices saw an on-month rise of 1.3 percent and an on-year rise of 18.9 percent. Moon Hyeon, Arirang News. The South Korean won is falling against the U.S. dollar as geopolitical uncertainties in the Middle East continue and with lowered expectations for early interest rate cuts by the U.S. Central Bank. At the close of Tuesday's session, the $1 exchange rate hit 13.94 after surpassing the $1,401 mark during the day for the first time in 17 months. This comes in light of the Federal Reserve's recent meeting notes that pushed back the likelihood of rate cuts this year and the recent conflict between Iran and Israel that has led to a strengthening greenback driven by increased safe haven demand. South Korea's central bank says they would be monitoring the foreign currency market closely. 
Samsung Electronics is set to receive over six billion U.S. dollars in subsidies from the Biden administration to advance its chip-making ambitions in the U.S. The pledge comes a week after a similar grant to Taiwan's chip-making giant. Yi Singjie has details. The U.S. government announced on Monday that it has decided to provide up to 6.4 billion U.S. dollars in subsidies under the U.S. Chips Act to Samsung Electronics, which is investing in a high-tech semiconductor production facility in Taylor, Texas. In line with the grant announced by Washington, Samsung Electronics will invest $17 billion to expand the size and investment target of the semiconductor manufacturing plant under construction, with a total of approximately $45 billion in investment by 2030. Under the proposed investment in Taylor, the South Korean tech giants will construct a comprehensive advanced manufacturing cluster, including two leading-edge logic foundry fabrications, a research and development fab, and an advanced packaging facility. The $6.4 billion in subsidies given to Samsung Electronics is the third largest to date. American semiconductor company Intel is set to receive $8.5 billion, followed by Taiwan's TSMC, which will receive $6.6 .6 billion. $39 billion worth of incentives were put aside under the terms of the U.S. Chips Act to encourage chipmakers to build, expand, or improve semiconductor facilities in the U.S., with the Commerce Department looking to invest some $28 billion of the total sum in chipmakers like Samsung Electronics. This comes as the Biden administration has been pushing for initiatives to drive up domestic chip manufacturing amid the U.S.-China rivalry. Investments being made by major chipmakers, including Samsung, will put the U.S. on track to deliver on its plan to produce around 20 percent of the world's leading-edge logic chips by 2030. Yi Seung-jae, Arirang News. China's economy showed stronger than expected growth in the first quarter. According to the National Bureau of Statistics of China on Tuesday, gross domestic product grew by 5.3 percent from the previous year from January to March. This was well above the forecast by economists polled by Reuters and exceeded growth recorded in the fourth quarter of last year. The surprising figure was largely attributed to a surge in industrial production from robust high-tech manufacturing. As the rain clouds receded, yellow dust covered the skies today. Seoul will be covered by dust and will look blurry. The concentration of fine dust in Seoul has soared to two to three times higher than the usual levels. A fine dust warning has been issued in Gangwon-do province, and the air will continue to be murky in the center parts of the country. If you're outside, you should wear a fine dust mask. The weather will be generally sunny and warm tomorrow, but air quality will stay at bad levels nationwide. It is recommended that those with respiratory diseases refrain from going outside. Yellow dust is expected until the day after tomorrow. Tomorrow's Seoul and Daegu will start off at 10 degrees Celsius. Highs in Seoul will be topping out at 23, Busan 22 degrees. Before the weekend, daytime temperatures in Seoul will rise to around 25 degrees, and the weather will continue to be warmer than usual. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world.
That is News Center for tonight. Thank you for watching. A panel session coming up.